Hello out there, this is Nicole Hemsoth, editor of HPC Wire, and we're here today with another in our series of in-depth interviews. Today we're going to be talking about benchmarks, specifically how GPUs stack up against Intel Xeon Phi coprocessors. So clearly this is a topic of hot debate, and as always, the answer about which is more suitable comes down to it depends. So here to talk to us about that and offer a comparison in the context of uh, real-world financial applications, uh, specifically embarrassingly parallel Monte Carlo algorithms, is Jorg Lotze from uh, financial services software firm Accelerate. Hi. So if, if you could uh, give us a sense of your background uh, before you, you got to Accelerate up until now, specifically on the, um, your experiences with GPUs, uh, coprocessors, hardware. All right. So um, basically, I come from from a research background in telecommunications engineering um, before we started Accelerate. And uh, it sounds like it's a completely different field, but we were facing similar problems than, than what we're seeing now in finance. So it's all about making fast real-time processing on various different bits of hardware. And uh, during that kind of research, um, we played around with the um, even with the IBM cell processor, with GPUs, with even embedded processors of all sorts uh, in order to make kind of fast software radio implementations in that context. And that's where all this uh, experience came from and uh, that's also how the idea for, for this company and this, um, this tool came about because all these techniques and, um, and things learned there, we quickly realized that it can be applied in an industrial context in a completely different field. Uh, and that's what we're focusing on now. So we are providing software for finance that uh, allows quantitative analysts to implement their algorithms and focus on their algorithms. And we take care to automatically uh, get the benefit of all these high-performance hardware uh, without the users actually needing to worry about all these low-level uh, implementation details. Okay. So in a sense, it makes it possible for... Um, for quants to write fast software, without, uh, which is easy to maintain um, and, and benefit from these uh, really interesting new hardwares. Okay, uh, interesting. So, so we're going to get to your, your actual findings of, about the comparisons in a moment. But first, I think it's important to note that, that you tested this across uh, a couple of different types of algorithms. And I think that's an important point here. Will you set us up here and give us the, the larger view on why this is important for this benchmark? Yeah, so uh, I think for any benchmark, it's always important to, to look at a specific algorithm and always see it in the context of uh, what was it tested with. You can't just answer the question of which one is better generically. generically. Um, so here, because uh, our clients are in finance mainly, so we, we looked at two algorithms in the financial world, uh, which are often occurring in the financial world, and uh, we picked two which have different characteristics. So uh, the first one is an embarrassing parallel um, Monte Carlo for pricing a swaption portfolio. Embarrassing parallel in this sense is, is really um, all the Monte Carlo paths are completely independent, can be 100% parallel, and there's literally no sequential bits in this. And uh, the second application is quite different. It's for pricing American options using a Monte Carlo technique as well. But here, um, those paths are not independent. So it needs to be solved uh, for different time steps uh, iteratively. So each time step needs some regression computed over the, over the whole path uh, in order to go back to the previous one. So we don't have independent paths here, and we have an iterative component, which uh, is not good for parallelism in general. So it's kind of a very different characteristic, and uh, that's why we picked those two uh, different applications. Mm -hmm. And these are both uh, very representative algorithms across all of financial services, correct? Uh, yes, like on finance pricing, and Monte Carlo is, is the dominant kind of uh, numerical technique, and... Uh, and different kinds and, and American kind of uh, style options are, are around a lot. So, and, and the other one as well. So it's, it's really, it represents a large set of common pricing methods. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's a very real world context here. So uh, to get to the hardware side of this, you, you ran your tests using Xeon Phi, uh, NVIDIA's Tesla uh, K20X, and you, I, I believe you also used uh, Sandy Bridge just, just for a point of comparison. Can you, can you set us up on the hardware side now? 
All right. So yes, exactly. So we, we've been using the, the brand new Intel Xeon Phi uh, as an accelerator processor. So this is a coprocessor that uh, just came out this year, and uh, it, it's basically massively parallel. It has uh, 60 cores, uh, four times hyper-threaded, so you end up having 240 hardware threads that you can exploit, and as a wide vector unit, so it's really for, for highly parallel number crunching. And uh, the same can be said for the Tesla GPU, uh, although this, is, this has been around for much longer, but uh, it has lots and lots of like 2,600 CUDA cores here. So um, lots and lots of parallel units that uh, should be kept, kept, kept busy for highly parallel pro, uh, parallelism. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's also a coprocessor. And of course, for comparison, we also looked as, as a standard GPU, a CPU that you currently find in practically all servers, which is uh, the Xeon Sandy Bridge generation. They are also multi-core, they are also, and they are very powerful. So it always makes sense to put those three in relation and not just the Phi and the Tesla. And, and to further set things up, you make some really interesting points in this about, about uh, memory. So let's, let's talk about that for just a second as it applies to, to this benchmark. Um, okay, so yeah, when, when you see those platforms, um, Everybody just thinks about teraflops and like uh, how fast it is for compute capacity. But what's actually equally important is how fast can it access its memory, and how much time is spent in getting the getting the data into that memory. So it's always good to find the right, right balance between computing and memory. So if an application becomes compute bound, then yes, you you're going to get close to these teraflops that you normally that you see here. But that usually means for one memory access, you need to do a lot of in instructions to to make that work. So it's always the balance between memory and uh, and um, computing instructions. And uh, as soon as caching comes into play, which obviously is in place in all, all these platforms, um, this becomes a little bit unpredictable. So you never know if an application is really compute or memory bound before you actually put it to test. Right, absolutely. So I, I feel like we need a drum roll, uh, drum roll here so that we can we can set up your findings. What did you find in the context of these applications and this uh, hardware configuration that you have set up? Um, so just because we just talked about this compute and memory bound, so um, the first, the, the Monte Carlo, um, which is embarrassingly parallel, so that's a LIBOR swap compressor, um, is also very compute heavy and uses relatively little memory. So this is a strongly compute bound uh, on all the platforms we've seen, which is ideal for uh, for the parallel processes like the Phi and the, and the GPU. And uh, it can be seen here clearly. So um, we got speed ups of, let me see, on the Kepler GPU compared to a sequential implementation of uh, six, 96 times. Um, and on the Phi of like 45 times, the, the parallel Sandy Bridge also got faster than the number of cores, so it's like nearly 20 times faster. And uh, so this, you can clearly see that it scales very well uh, for highly parallel architectures. Right, um, your conclusion section, I, I think that you make a really important point. I'm, I'm just gonna verbatim read this. We've seen that there is one processor that needs to be added to the picture, the commodity multi-core CPU. This is already a part of many server configurations and for some applications, like the ones we're talking about here, um, it can give better comparable performance in an accelerator processor when optimized correctly. Um, so between the two of those, <clears throat> again, GPU wins, but can, can you go into more detail on this? Yes. So, so here, um, yeah, basically lots of people just think about those accelerate processors on their own, but they should always consider the parallel CPU as well. So here we have a 16 core uh, Sandy Bridge system and uh, like and if it's heavily optimized, it actually gets a little bit, and it's only like twice, two and a half times slower than the Xeon Phi, and about five times slower than the, the, than the Tesla C GPU. So all those massive speed ups um, that I've just said is, is compared to sequential, but the parallel highly optimized Sandy Bridge can also get pretty fast. But now for this application, the first one, um, with this, uh, which is embarrassingly parallel, still there's a is a huge benefit for using GPUs or the, or the Xeon Phi for this. While uh, the main point for the conclusion is this American Monte Carlo, which has an iterative step in it, so it's not fully parallel. Actually, the Sandy Bridge is the fastest. Well, let's say it's, it's about as, it's the same speed as the GPU. 
and uh, I think that's that's kind of an interesting finding here, and really tells you that you should consider all the platforms when you're comparing a spe specific algorithm. Absolutely, and and you mentioned that there were a lot of parallels between what you're doing here in telecommunications. Do you think that this same set of findings is going to be true for some other key markets uh, in a very similar way? If so, what are those, and where is this maybe most relevant outside of financial services? Um, I think it's 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 a generally relevant. Like um, the the main points is yeah, you shouldn't just compare the GPU and the Phi. You should also put Sandy Bridge into the picture. That's that's for sure, and uh, that that probably applies everywhere. The, the other thing is that it's hard to tell in advance which one is going to be best. So it's uh, before you actually do testing because all these theoretical teraflops and memory bandwidth uh, they don't mean much for any real applications. Um, in general, other contexts, I can see this working, applying also to oil and gas, to uh, to whatever, bi uh, biochemistry, and uh, all these fields are basically where high performance is there. Uh, high performance computing is used. Right. Uh, you know, I, I'm just curious, on a broad level, uh, what are financial s services firms actually doing? I mean, would you say a lot of the work that you're doing involves pretty vanilla configurations, lots of servers, not a lot of acceleration. I mean, how frequent is it that you find ultra high performance accelerated systems in, in some of these firms? Well, they're all looking a lot for, for high performance systems, especially with, uh, with the regulators coming in, like after the financial crisis, uh, there has been a lot of um, added complexity to, to their risk computations, for example. So, so now they need to do a lot more risk, uh, risk scenarios and uh, have to compute new measures, and that's really across the whole portfolio of instruments that a bank has. So you're talking about a huge amount of data that needs, uh, that needs to be priced for thousands and thousands of scenarios, uh, different contexts, and, so, and that's usually in a Monte Carlo setup. So you're looking at like grids of, I don't know, hundreds of machines running uh, six, seven hours overnight and uh, barely getting the work done. So this is clearly a high performance computing uh, setup. Um, I think what's different with, with finance is uh, that this is relatively new to them compared, if you, compared to oil and gas and physics. So they're just kind of learning and uh, that there's not that crazy expert hardware expertise in all those different platforms. Uh, and that's actually why, why we are there. Okay, so, so you are saying then that GPUs, coprocessors are still an experimental phase then at a lot of financial no, services firms? No, no I, okay. no, I don't say that. So it's, it's become mainstream. A lot of banks have actually become uh, gone pa public, for example, JP Morgan, and about using large amounts of GPUs in their day-to-day -day real production process. It's not an experimental thing anymore. Okay. So it's really gone mainstream there. Okay, great. Um, one last question for you. Do you see this, this trend that you have in your benchmarks with uh, GPUs being the clear winner changing as the technology develops? I know it's part of your, your job to follow some of the innovations um, on the processor front. There, there are some interesting things around the corner. Are they going to shake things up enough to, to topple this, this hierarchy we have? Um, yeah, first of all, I mean, the, the general conclusion, um, I mean, this is two specific applications. I'm sure there will be others where this picture changes and is different, right? So it's really just two points uh, in the whole big space of applications. Uh, so I'm sure that, that this is not a general answer. So I think the FI will also be better for other applications. Uh, you also have to consider that the FI only came out this year and uh, Tesla GPUs have been around since 2007, as far as I know. So um, these, this picture might also change a little bit. Um, so I don't think there is a general answer. In general, I think all those platforms are good for something. And uh, you just have to find out which one is best for yours. And, uh, and, basic, and also what needs to be considered here for these numbers, uh, there went a, there's a lot of optimizations which went into this. So there's like weeks worth of work to tune it like this to get these numbers. While uh, most users in a real world context, uh, they don't really have the time to do this. The I, I said I had my last question a second ago. I have another one. And let's, let's talk very briefly about the optimization uh, comparison between uh, optimizing for GPU and, and then for Xeon Phi, which, which supposedly is easier to get up and running with, but the optimization is, is still pretty lengthy. Is, is, that, is that your experience also? 
Um, yeah, in general, yes. Um, it's, but it's, I think it's on both platforms. Even on the GPU, it's relatively quick to just have something running, but uh, to get it fast on all these, and that includes the Sandy Bridge, if you want to optimize it, um, it's it's not easy to actually get the most out of that hardware. So, so those optimizations really take a good bit of expertise. Um, and that's also, you know, what what our uh, software development kit is trying to do. So it automates those optimizations for users, so that they don't need to worry about it, and they can get uh, one source code portably running on all these platforms, and basically get put them to the test and see which one works best, without hand tuning everything. Uh, and I think what's also need to be said here is uh, all those optimizations make the code very specific to a specific hardware. So uh, the portability co goes completely out of the window. And that's typically in a, in a free world context is not is, is something that especially banks don't want. And I, I'm sure that in other fields, uh, it's the same. So portability is actually quite important to them. So I, I doubt that they will all go down to that level of optimization that we've seen here. I see. Well, Jörg, this has been absolutely fascinating. Thank you for putting in the effort to compare both of these in, in the, uh, the context of real-world applications, and we'll check in with you again soon. Thank you. Thank you.